This is the second part of a two-part series on the topic of dam foundations. In the first part, Dr. Don Deere discussed significant geologic features and methods of exploration to discover and evaluate those features. In this part, Dr. Deere will discuss methods for remediation of these features. His discussions address dam foundations and dams that are not performing properly due to the existence of a significant geologic feature. Once again, it is my pleasure to present Dr. Don Deere. Let us move to the next topic of foundation remedial works. Once weak features identified, they require that remedial construction be done to improve the foundation. Additional excavation heads the list, in my opinion, of remedial measures for treating weak geologic features. It is often the most practical and cost-effective method. Of course, if the questionable zone is not found until it is uncovered during construction, the extra excavation quantities may result in scheduled delays, additional cost, and claims. One of the principal reasons for the separate excavation contract is precisely to avoid these unpleasant surprises in the main dam contract where the real money is. The geometric form of the unanticipated excavation may range from general deepening in an area of weathered or altered rock to trench, uh, trench excavation along a fault zone to expensive and slow added or shaft excavation with concrete backfill. Two cases come to mind where a number of concrete blocks of gravity dams had already been founded above weak near horizontal shear zones. The seriousness of the problem was recognized and several possible remedial measures were examined to determine the most feasible from the viewpoint of providing an adequate safety factor against sliding, of lowest cost and least schedule interference, and of less interference to the construction of the remaining dam blocks. Decisions were made to excavate a number of tunnels under the existing blocks along the shear zones and backfilling them with concrete to serve as shear keys. The objectives were achieved and the dams now have several years of successful operation. In examining the different solutions, the design team must be resourceful and should include specialists in engineering geology, rock mechanics, structural mechanics, in construction planning and contract administration. The second remedial work that we will talk about is consolidation and curtain grouting. Grouting is no stranger to any dam engineer or geologist as it is done at every modern dam site. I am bringing it up to discuss a number of recent improvements that have been made in some of the procedures. Drill holes for grouting are now made in the majority of cases with rotary percussion drills rather than with rotary diamond drills. The advance rates are up to five times faster with similar lower cost. Down the hole drills of three inch and four inch diameters have been used on a number of projects. Grout mixes of neat cement or cement with bentonite additives have now been mostly replaced by thicker and more dense grout mixtures of around 0.75 to 1 water to cement by weight with about one half to one percent of super plasticizer to reduce the viscosity and yield point. The hardened grout is denser, stronger, and more resistant to chemical and mechanical deterioration. A single grout mix is commonly used throughout the grouting of a project instead of starting with a thin mix and then progressively changing to thicker ones. Lower injection rates, as low as two and a half to a little over six gallons per minute, that is 600 to 1,000 liters per hour, are sometimes specified. That is to give a uniform grouting to the uh, rock. Pressures are often allowed that are higher nowadays than those that would formerly be used. And they are controlled in many of the recent dams 
together with the volume of grout by the Lombardi Deer Gin Method, G-I-N meeting grouting intensity number. The following brief discussion is divided into consolidation grouting and curtain grouting. Consolidation grouting, also called blanket or area grouting, consists of grouting on some predetermined grid pattern to a shallow depth in the range of 20 to 35 feet. The grid spacing for the primary holes may range from about 12 to 24 feet. Secondary holes may be drilled and grouted in the, in the center of the grid as mandatory holes in the specifications or as required if the grout admission of an adjacent primary hole exceeds a specified quantity. Similarly, tertiary holes may be added as needed where the secondary holes have large grout admissions. Consolidation grouting accomplishes two things. It increases the modulus or stiffness of the rock mass and it reduces the permeability of the rock mass. Both good things for the dam foundation. By filling the more open fractures and joints completely or almost completely and the thinner fractures partially, the grouting homogenizes the foundation rock, leading to less settlement of the dam and less under seepage. Consolidation grouting is required for almost every concrete arch dam, for most concrete gravity dams, and for some embankment dams, depending on the dam height, the foundation type, and the philosophy of the dam designer. On several recent projects, I have recommended the increase of the depth of the consolidation holes by up to 50% or so, just for those two or three lines upstream of the future deep grout curtain, which is the topic of the next section. In preparing the drawings and specifications, the design team must make three decisions about the grout curtain geometry. The depth of the grout curtain, a single line versus a multi-line curtain, and the spacing of the primary grout holes. The primary grout holes are the first holes drilled of the curtain. They are widely spaced and carried to considerable depths. I prefer to drill these with core recovery and with Lujon permeability test, but only a few of the primary holes, about one of each four or one of each five. These should be drilled to a depth of, I feel, about 1H, where H is the future hydraulic head above the foundation grade at the point in question. These primary exploratory holes are grouted, and the results of these, plus the results of any original design exploratory holes in the region, or in the immediate area, are examined to arrive at the depths of the remainder of the primary grout holes. Now, the remainder of the primary grout holes would not be core drilled, and my recommendation that they not be tested for Lujon permeability. I think the grouting results give us the uh, information uh, in themselves. The depth of the primary holes, other than the exploratory primary holes, is frequently in the range of one half to three quarters of the hydraulic head. The depths of the secondary holes will depend on the grout admissions for the adjacent primary holes, but usually it will be somewhat less. Similarly, similar procedures are used for the tertiary and quaternary holes and for the quinary holes if needed. At most rock foundations, the single line curtain is employed. Where poor rock quality exists, a triple line curtain is commonly used to reduce the erosion and the piping potential. Upon occasion, a five-line or seven-line curtain has been constructed with the final two lines of microfine cement or of hard, durable chemical grout after setting. With respect to the spacing of the primary grout holes, the range is about 20 feet to 40 feet. After the primary holes are finished in an area, the secondary holes are split spaced between the primaries and the tertiaries are split spaced between all the others, as are the quaternaries if needed. If quaternary holes were used, and if the original primary hole spacing were 40 feet, the final spacing after the quaternaries would be 5 feet. 
uh, in the areas of quaternary takes of, uh, uh, or admissions greater than specified or desired, then additional quin quinaries would be drilled, resulting in a two and a half foot final spacing and occasionally even a few additional holes. In scoriaceous, highly permeable lava, in karstic limestone, or in sandstone or other rock types with very open, very permeable joints, my philosophy is to provide a triple line curtain. The outside lines are grouted first through the primary, secondaries, and tertiaries to act as barrier lines or confining lines for the grout injected in the central line. The final closure or final tightening of the rock may require in this central line up to quaternary or quinary holes. My final comment on grouting is to say that I have found the trend of employing field computers to control the grouting rates, quantities injected, and grouting pressures to be very welcome and of value to the grouting engineer. Grouting statistics can also best be displayed and stored by the computers. In lieu of grout curtains, cutoffs may be used to reduce seepage below dams, where one, the rock foundation contains so many voids or fractures with clay that the efficiency and permanence of the grout curtain is brought into question. Or two, if a layer of permeable sand and gravel occurs below an embankment dam. Slurry trenches have been used below earth embankments where the dam is not too high and where the permeable layer to be cut off is shallow, say less than 60 feet. A wide trench with sloping sides is excavated by a drag line and is supported by a thin bentonite slurry. The excavated alluvium is mixed at the surface with some additional bentonite and perhaps with some more clay and silt and then is redeposited in the trench by the drag line. The result is a cheap low permeability, low density cutoff. One can see why this type of cutoff is seldom used below high dams. Concrete panel walls of two and a half to about five feet in thickness of cast in place concrete, trimmed into a vertical slot filled with bentonite slurry is a popular type of cutoff below high embankment dams. The excavation of the trench is by an elongated clamshell working between surface concrete guide walls. The wall is excavated in concrete backfilled in alternating panels. Depths of alluvium of up to 200 feet or so have been constructed by this procedure. Some designers prefer a very low strength concrete backfill called a plastic concrete in an attempt to match the modulus of the alluvial foundation so that under the weight of the dam the settlement of the wall and the settlement of the uh, alluvium will be similar. Others prefer a moderate strength concrete, uh, concrete of perhaps 1,500 to 2,500 PSI. Good experience has been reported for both types of concrete. Backfilled overlapping tunnels have been used a number of times to construct a vertical concrete cutoff wall. The wall may be constructed from the top downward or from the bottom upward. After the first tunnel is excavated, it is backfilled with cast in place concrete, and the second tunnel, either above it or below it, is begun, backfilled, etc. The type of cutoff is used in poor rock or dry alluvium or other soil. Excavation of the tunnels may be by hand, by small mechanical road headers, or in some cases by light blasting. Trenches may be excavated in sections by the more exotic means of hydrophrase or high pressure water jets. The secan overlapping method has also been used to construct vertical cutoff walls. In this method, alternate drill holes are drilled in concrete backfilled. The infilling drill hole is then drilled between the first two holes with care and difficulty to assure several inches of overlap. The drill hole diameters may be in the range of 18 to 30 inches. My own experience with cutoff walls includes concrete panel walls through alluvium with boulders, three cases. 
overlapping tunnels constructed both from the bottom up and from the top down, three cases, one in friable sandstone, another in karstic limestone, and one in a complex volcanic sand, scoria, and weathered andesite. And secant wall, one case in scoria and weathered uh, lavas. Moving on to the topic of drainage. Drainage control in the foundation is an essential for dams. Concrete dams customarily have one or more grouting galleries close to the rock foundation for grouting the rock. The grout holes are drilled from the upstream part of the floor of the gallery, with the drill holes angled uh, 10 to 15 degrees in an upstream direction. The gallery also serves as a drainage gallery, with the drain holes drilled from the downstream part of the concrete gallery floor, with the holes angled at 5 or 10 degrees in a downstream direction. The drain holes may be from 3 to 4 inches in diameter typically, and are spaced at 10 feet to 25 foot distances. The lengths of the drain holes are similar to those of the grout holes or somewhat shorter. The holes should be provided with a rigid plastic pipe outlet with fittings to allow the valve to be closed and the water pressure to be measured when desired. The drain should also have reverse goosenecks so that the air cannot enter into the drain hole and promote a precipitation of minerals, primarily uh, iron, but uh, also other uh, oxides. Drains may also be provided with a double perforated casing and the inner pipe wrapped in filter fabric in zones of possible erosion and piping of fines, such as you might get in a weathered rock or in a fault zone. To, rinse, to prevent the seepage from exiting the abutment area just downstream of the dam that might cause piping of fines or saturation of the slope, special methods may be taken. These include covering the area with an inverted filter drain, or better yet, to drill drain holes into the abutment. Failure to control the drainage has led to slope instability with uh, potential problems to the edge of the dam abutment. Upon occasion, the drainage system has been enhanced by excavating drainage adits uh, from which drainage holes could then be drilled and piezometers installed for monitoring the water pressures in the abutment. Would any of the panel members like to comment uh, on the methods of remediation that uh, I have covered? I know that a lot of you have good experience in this. Uh, Don, in addition to the consolidation and curtain grouting that you mentioned, I think it's probably important to talk a little bit about the contact between the foundation and the dam to be built and the need to treat that surface with, with such things as slush grouting and dental concrete. I know there's lots of examples of problems that have uh, arisen because that area didn't get uh, properly addressed uh, when the dam uh, started being built. Well, I think this is, is certainly true, but uh, I also have a, a little hesitation about the uh, slurry grouting of the, of the surface. I think sometimes that those uh, are so thin that uh, they are very, very weak, and uh, as the uh, <coughs> material is being placed and compacted ab above them, if this is a, an earth embankment, for instance, that they might loosen. And uh, I do recall on one large dam where the consulting board was visiting the project, and uh, we saw water uh, flowing out at the contact uh, <coughs> between the earth and uh, uh, underneath this uh, little thin layer of grout. So we had them excavate several trenches so we could look at it, and it was a severe problem. Uh, they just simply had not uh, been able to, to get the nice seating that they wanted and have it to be preserved. My own particular feeling about placing a, a covering is to use concrete sufficiently thick <clears throat> that it does allow uh, soil to be placed above it and the dam to be started if it's an embankment dam. And there are a number of projects in recent years where the quantity of concrete, we don't call it dental concrete because that gets bid at too high a price. 
We simply call it a smoothing concrete. Let's see, another term that's been used, a homogenizing concrete, a leveling concrete. It's to put in so that when you walk away from it, you have a minimum of six inches, and in lots of areas, up to 12 or even 24 inches. And you have improved the surface. Not only do you have a contact that's going to remain as a contact, but you can now place the rest of the dam in, in rapid uh, high-speed uh, mode. And some of these uh, excavations through the weathered rock down to the foundation level ends up with extremely irregular uh, topography, which is almost impossible to do a good job of placing the uh, thing. But by placing the concrete, uh, we can achieve the uh, thing. I think that's a good point, and I'd uh, like to move on and, and see if Jim has a, a comment on this. I have a question. A question. <laughs> um, you mentioned your preference uh, for grouting. Do you have a preference of percussion drilling versus core drilling for drainage? I, I would say the answer is yes. I probably have gone with uh, percussion drill holes more often with, uh, the, with ones that have been uh, uh, done by rotary drilling. And uh, the reason is they are so much cheaper. You can put five times the number of drain holes if you do it by percussion drilling. So you can actually bring the spacing down to, to five feet if you wish, or three feet. Uh, now, in a number of dam sites, the agencies have a policy of putting their drain holes in with rotary drilling. And uh, I think they are probably getting a superior job. But I really wonder if uh, we don't get the same benefits from the more closely spaced uh, percussion drills. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, it's a little bit on what the contractor uh, has available, particularly if you're coming in to do some remedial work and you have to get into a drainage and you need a drill or something that you can get the hole in. But I think your point is well taken, and uh, it is certainly one that uh, engineers differ a little bit on. Their philosophy may be uh, somewhat uh, divergent. Frank, uh, do you have comments on this? Please. In your discussion, you mentioned that they're tending to use higher pressures during grouting, and you also touched on the benefits of using computers and sensors to monitor the grouting process itself. And I'd just like to uh, essentially chip in that we shouldn't let the precision of the computers and the trend toward higher pressures uh, distract us from the fact that when we're grouting in the upper portions of the foundation, the blanket grouting, the consolidation grouting, and the first stage of the curtain grouting, that we very closely watch those pressures and to keep them under control because of the low overburden pressures that exist. Well, your point again has been borne out by experience. Uh, <clears throat> in numerous cases, there has been hydro fracturing or hydro jacking of uh, rock, particularly along the abutments or in a shallow foundation where we have some stratified material uh, in, the, in the dam bottom. Uh, it is surprising in, in massive rock, a normal, let's say a granite with a normal amount of jointing, the very high pressure that you can use uh, with surface consolidation grouting and not see any uh, lifting or any damage whatsoever, but a very good percolation of the grout throughout. So uh, I'm, I'm in favor of using fairly high pressure, a lot higher than we, we normally do, uh, in the deeper uh, rock let's say below 15, 20 feet. But again, we have to be very careful in zones of uh, questionable rock, in zones along the abutments where the stress condition is not real good for resisting a high grouting pressure. Uh, I could name two or three instances where we have jacked up uh, <coughs> beginning parts of dam construction that were already, with the concrete already poured and set by adjacent grouting, which got on a little too high. However, Frank, the computer grouting can also, if you're watching that closely, uh, the computer plots, and I like live time plots uh, of, the, of the pressure versus time and of the volume, rate of volume versus time. And uh, just you see a little block where all of a sudden the pressure drops and the volume goes up, and you know immediately that uh, you've hydrofracked and uh, then you can reduce the pressure. If you try to keep grounding that same pressure, it often goes along the same, and then another hydrofrac, and then another hydrofrac. Uh, <clears throat> but as you say, you ought to start off with pressures that are not too high uh, to induce that. I think the point is certainly uh, well taken. 
Dave, uh, you had a point, I think, that you uh, were discussing earlier about maintenance yes, uh, on uh, drains. Yeah, during your comments, uh, uh, you indicated how essential drainage is uh, to, to the performance of the, of the foundation. That uh, the Bureau of Reclamation has used uh, drainage as a defensive measure uh, for, for the dams and leaching from uh, the upstream grout curtain and, uh, and from the parent rock uh, tends to reduce the efficiency of the drains or plugs the drains. And um, I believe that drainage really needs to be maintained in order to continue to verify the, the performance of the foundation uh, and of the, uh, the grouting. Uh, deferred maintenance uh, or delay of maintenance uh, to, to keep these drains clean will have a tendency to make uh, cleaning very expensive and uh, quite often they'll be delayed to the extent that the drains actually have to be re-drilled. Uh, but uh, I, I liked your point about the, uh, the drainage being essential in the part of the dam foundation. Well, I think you've touched a very critical point. In looking at existing dam foundations, particularly in old dams, one of the uh, things that we often see are plug drains. Their drainage system has lost its efficiency over time, and the maintenance has not always been done. And uh, then <clears throat> our recommendation has to be to clean the drains and almost automatically to add a certain number of new drains because the cleaning doesn't always get you back to uh, the zero condition. But drainage is, uh, is essential and uh, I'm very glad you brought that point up. Uh, I would like to add that in a project where uh, earthen dam, fairly high, some 400 feet high, was uh, founded on a sandstone uh, foundation of uh, a fair amount of weathering along the joints that made the whole sandstone very friable. And so we had to be particularly careful that no seepage water exited downstream in the side of the abutment in an unfiltered condition, because we knew it was going to bring uh, <clears throat> some uh, eroded fine sand. Well, a fairly good job was done. It was decided to cancel the grout curtain and to go in with a plan and to go in with a cutoff. So a cutoff uh, wall was done, a panel wall uh, <coughs> in the abutment uh, tying in with a uh, drainage curtain under the, under the bottom of the, of the river. However, they forgot to treat the area adjacent to the spillway. And the spillway was not part of the dam. It, took off from a low area some distance away. And while visiting the site uh, some two or three months after the dam was in the filling stage, uh, they took us to see a wet spot where they had uh, controlled it by literally pounding in about a six inch diameter white, uh, I remember that very well, uh, hardened uh, PVC pipe. And, the wa and that pipe was flowing half full of water the most beautiful clear water you ever saw. And I said, well, are you sure you're not getting any, uh, any leak or any uh, erosion and piping of fines? He said, no. I said, well, how about all of those little slide scars taken here and there? Well, it's rainfall. Well, it wasn't rainfall. We had seepage coming in to this downstream slope and <coughs> the, the <coughs> seeps, had actually little, di or little uh, deltas of sand that they were carrying. And in the pipe that was carrying this crystal clear water, I took off my hard hat, put it under the pipe, brought it out, poured the water off, and the bottom was covered with nice, beautiful, clean sand. And it's amazing when you have a good flow going in, in what seems to be clear water, the amount of sediment it can bring. One reason in your drainage curtain in dams to put little collector pipes down underneath uh, or collector containers, let the drainage water go into those and then to flow out uh, through a pipe to another tank. And that way you can make a certain number of the drains as uh, monitor wells to check on the, to check on the uh, plaguing uh, or the, the erosion of fines. Well, I think that we've, uh, we've covered uh, this topic fairly well. 
And uh, our next topic is uh, going to deal with uh, foundation assets, assessment uh, for existing dams. I now would like to talk about foundation assessment of existing dams. While the previous discussions were more oriented toward dams in design or under construction, many of the same principles apply to the assessment of existing dams. For example, the weak geologic features that require treatment for a new dam probably also occur to some extent at most existing dams. If those features occurred and were identified during construction, they likely were treated. The two key questions are, were all of the weak features discovered and were the recognized features analyzed and treated sufficiently? The difficulty in providing answers to these two questions is precisely the difficulty in assessing the foundations of existing dams. The fact that the dam is still in operation and is functioning is a welcome observation, but it does not necessarily provide the assurance that all is well for future operations for the maximum design flood has not occurred as yet. Second, detailed inspection may indicate that the damaged foundations have not performed flawlessly, as indicated perhaps by cracks in concrete, seepage and wet spots in the dam and abutments, and drains in a plugged state. Third, time-dependent processes that may lead to detrimental behavior down the road are still ongoing seepage and piping, drain hole plugging, increasing piezometric uh, levels locally, or slow creep displacements. The background study for an existing dam differs in several ways from that for a new dam. They both would include studies of regional and local geology, but the site inspections would be different in that the reservoir would obscure much of the upstream geology. But new exposures may be available in the downstream area along new road cuts and other uh, excavations. Of particular value in the foundation assessment are records of the original design exploration in the form of boring logs, rock cores, geologic maps and geologic profiles, together with a foundation design report. The plan and specifications must also be made available for the study. For some very old dams, these documents may not all be available which creates a hardship in dam assessment. Of equal value are the records of construction. These would include construction photographs, excavation records, grouting records, design and construction memos, and change orders, and the as-built drawings. Again, if not all of these are available, the foundation assessment will suffer. The history of performance of a dam may provide vital clues. The records of visual inspections and instrumentation records may be the keys to the historical performance of the dam and its foundation. Time plots of the data are helpful in recognizing trends and correlations with temperature, reservoir level, or rainfall. Of importance are dam displacements, drainage discharge from the drain holes, drainage from the galleries, or springs in the abutment and piezometric levels. Attention must be focused on anomalous behavior and any increasing trends. After the completion of the aforementioned study, the assessment team will probably have some preliminary thoughts about the dam foundations. An important item is whether new investigations are needed and of what types. Commonly, several new borings will be drilled, targeting the anticipated problem areas. The borings may be made from the top of the dam or angled as necessary from galleries in the dam or the abutments. Careful drilling with the most appropriate equipment and pressure blowout devices may be needed, particularly if you're drilling from uh, galleries that are well below the reservoir level. Undisturbed cores from weak zones may be desired for modulus or direct shear laboratory testing. And Lujon permeability and borehole photography or TV scanning down the borehole may be desirable. The installation of permanent piezometers is frequently done, including the sophisticated multi-port piezometer in certain cases. Infrequently, 
a drainage gallery will be driven or an existing gallery extended to allow observations to be made, borings to be drilled, or monitoring devices to be installed. At this stage of the assessment, the background information and the results of the new exploration are analyzed to see if any particular foundation problem exists, and if so, what are the remedial measures that should be considered by the assessment team. The degree of urgency must be assessed, as well as the need for an immediate lowering of the reservoir, if such be the case. Perhaps only long-term monitoring devices will be required, together with a partial restriction on reservoir height. Frequently, no additional work is required. The next discussions will deal with remedial measures that might be used, in case the assessment so indicates. It is important that the design assessment team have access to an experienced construction advice in conducting the alternative studies of the remedial measures. In my own experience, it seems that the most common remedial measure, either singly or in combination with other methods, is an enhancement of the drainage system to bring about a lowering of piezometric levels or to reduce piping and sloughing. Enhancement methods have included the following, cleaning out of the pumping sump and providing standby pump and emergency power sources, cleaning out drain holes and adding new ones, excavating a drainage gallery or extending an existing one, drilling long drainage holes from the surface into the abutments, and covering seepage areas with an inverted filter. Only occasionally has additional grouting been done, In a few cases where drain holes have had increasing flows and have indicated sediment transport, the holes have been grouted and new drains drilled. In others, the grout curtain was reinforced with new grout holes where it was suspected that the grout had, ex uh, had deteriorated or the clay had been washed out. In limestone particularly, where the clay has been partially eroded by the leakage water passing through solution cavities, regrouting has been carried out both to reduce seepage and to prevent further enlargement of the cavities by erosion of the infield soil that could threaten the dam by the occurrence of a sinkhole. Where sliding resistance or overturning resistance is judged to be insufficient under maximum design flood, either along a weak subhorizontal zone in the foundation rock or at one of the construction lift joints, of a concrete gravity dam. High capacity grouted steel tendons have been installed and post-tensioned to increase the vertical force on the dam. The steel tensioned anchors are often needed for dams where the spillway capacity has been found to be inadequate and the dam could conceivably be overtopped. A number of concrete gravity dams have undergone this treatment as well as having the spillway capacity enlarged. Where leakage or piping has been observed in abutments, concrete cutoff walls have been chosen in some cases as a treatment to be carried out rather than additional grouting or drainage. While the time and cost of installation of a cutoff wall may be greater, the security given by the wall should be superior to just grouting. Different construction techniques are available, as noted previously, and the choice of the type of concrete wall to be installed depends on several factors, including the reservoir level at the time of the remedial construction work, the availability of the specialty contractors, and the preference of the designer and the construction team. Stability berms of compacted earth, gravel, or rock fill have been used numerous times to increase the stability of either the downstream or upstream slope, or both, of an earth embankment. Weak foundation material is most often associated with the slope failure. In some cases, the berm is needed when the height of the dam is to be raised. A few concrete dams, both arch and gravity, have been buttressed by concrete or rock fill following cracking and leakage during their first filling. I would ask the panel members to comment on their experiences with respect to investigations, assessment, or remedial construction for existing dam. Don, when, you, when you've got holes drilled 
in a dam foundation to uh, collect samples. Uh, there's a, often a tendency to put too much instrumentation in without a thought to just exactly what that instrumentation is going to tell you. Uh, I think the instrumentation that you do put in has to be uh, specifically designed to answer a question. And so you need to know what those questions are first, then pick your instrument to, to give you the answers to those questions. Duane, I again agree wholeheartedly. I think a number of dams have been over-instrumented to co collect data, and many times the data goes into a file system and is not really used because there's so much of it that may not be pertinent. So they think, well, we just have it for the record. Uh, <clears throat> as you say, it is much better to identify what the potential problem areas are and to get the instrumentation in that will give some answers to questions that you might have. Don, you know, we've talked about explorations for new dams and for the existing dams here. And it's been my experience that in the existing dams, the uh, tendency kind of is to go with the data that you have in order to try to make the assessment and make the decisions. And I guess I would like to emphasize that when you're, when the public safety is at issue and when you're trying to assess what a problem is and determine what's going on, that a lot of times the exploration has to be done regardless of the effort it requires and the cost that it requires in order to do it. Again, I think the point is extremely well taken. And I've known several instances in where it was judged to be necessary to lower the reservoir level. If this is a power uh, hydro project, uh, this is a very serious monetary consideration. And it even could get into uh, uh, public relations problems and regulatory problems. Uh, <clears throat> but on several instances, it has been deemed to be necessary, and uh, it had to be done. As you say, you must make your case and uh, st stick with it and convince the owners that these things have to be done. Don, um, I think uh, one of the things you brought attention to was uh, the, the need to pay attention to anomalies uh, in the dam's performance. Uh, over the long term, I believe that uh, we can become complacent with the performance of a structure, uh, the, the monitoring that is going on. And independent review or, or new eyes uh, can help pick up changes in that performance and, uh, uh, and I believe are critical to the long-term assurance of the, of the performance of the structure. And I think that uh, programmatic it, um, programmatic emphasis needs to be placed on the, the value of independent reviews or, or that new look. Yes, well, uh, <clears throat> I think those are, are good comments. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, a number of the projects I'm involved in where there is a board of consultants, uh, the fact that they can come to the project uh, maybe every six months during construction and again during the first filling gives a little uh, bit of the same independent look at things uh, that <clears throat> Uh, apparent or not as apparent to the people who are working on it full time. But during the operation period, which I think is the one you were referring to primarily, why it's also a, a very good period. If we all can think back on projects where the dam and the reservoir were just going along, functioning perfectly, and five years, ten years down the road, suddenly you go into the drainage gallery and you find that you have uh, 20 cubic yards of mud uh, on the floor you can hardly get into the uh, drain that piped and uh, so this means that this is a time dependent process it keeps going on and you must have the uh, the monitoring and the surveillance surveillance uh, as an ongoing thing for the life of the project no doubt of it I appreciate that comment, Dave. I'd like to reiterate and sort of reinforce what uh, Dave said with respect to assessment and UIs. Uh, sometimes uh, when we routinely take uh, uh, measurements on instrumentation, we don't really stop to think what it is that we're taking and interpret what we're, what we're looking at. And uh, we, we look at the overall perspective of what the, the trend of the data is. And, Sometimes, if we just look at a short period, that trend may be that there is no, nothing being changed. But if we, we look more closely at what that particular instrument is supposed to be telling us and look at all the data that is in the file and not just a segment of it, uh, then uh, we, we find that there's a different story. 
Uh, so the perspective with respect to new eyes, uh, uh, the new eyes, the fresh eyes would then undoubtedly look at the entire record and it's good periodically to have somebody different look at this, not only from the perspective of, of an uh, independent evaluation, but also, also with respect to inspections that are done routinely. So this is really an important feature and, and I know we have one situation uh, where this happened and it wasn't recognized that something was going on because the narrow time was being looked at and uh, when it's, uh, once somebody recognized this, the, the new eyes, uh, an analysis and evaluation was done and it was determined that the dam was actually moving and uh, lots of money had to be spent to remediate that situation. I think that's a good example of uh, new eyes looking at the data and looking at the data over a period that is sufficiently long to uh, allow you to judge things that are happening on a yearly basis and not necessarily on a month by month. Jim, you had a comment. Yeah, I'd like to add a little bit to the use of a board of consultants. This is something that TVA has been committed to for over 35 years. Our board meets once every six months and reviews at that point all the projects that are at whatever stage, be it uh, design, construction, maintenance, operation, uh, anything that relates to public safety and where issues are presently uh, being undertaken. And we found that it serves two purposes. Uh, one is to keep us sharp because we have to present to the board every six months the details of things, looking at the whole forest and not just the trees. And secondly, it brings an independent judgmental review that we feel is based on the highest level of experience to the projects and preserves the public interest in terms of safety and everything else in the public domain. And I feel very strongly that uh, it's enhanced the integrity and quality of our projects through the years. Uh, it's the, the independent look is just extremely important. As an independent consultant, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> <laughs> Gus, I think you were going to uh, tell us a little about some cutoff uh, experience that you've had. I, th this um, really plays a role into the proper type of remediation. Once it's identified that, that um, s there's a problem, and in particular with a seepage problem, what is the correct remediation measure to implement for that particular situation? And we had, a, 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 we had one situation where there was a difference of opinion. Uh, but um, what ended up happening was uh, a partial slurry wall was put in uh, to address a seepage condition that was causing some potential piping uh, in the one end of the, of the embankment. And um, so it was attempted, and it turned out that it didn't work. And then a different... Uh, a different set of eyes, again, as we mentioned before, came in, uh, evaluated everything that had been done, and disbanded with a cutoff, uh, but then addressed it by a, an elaborate drainage system to control and monitor the, the seepage. And uh, this, w this worked very well and has been in operation now for about two to three years, and there are no problems. So it's just uh, a situation where the proper assessment needs to be, to me to be made. And, and as you mentioned earlier, with respect to all the various disciplines involved, to bring all those people together to discuss the, the necessary remediation. Well, thank you for all of these comments on this particular topic. I think that uh, they've added to uh, the value of this session very much. In completing my presentation, I wish to thank the Interagency Committee on Dam Safety for inviting me to make this video. And special thanks are given to the panel members uh, whose comments have enhanced the breadth and the depth of my presentation on dam foundations. And finally, to the production crew that have helped in making this a most pleasant experience. <laughs>